Today is a very exciting day for our graduates, and um, it's a very touching day for me. And as I sit here and I look at the graduates coming up here, um, this coming year we'll be here in this church for 20 years. I remember walking into a hospital room and uh, seeing Tim and Diane with Hunter met her right when he was first born. I remember walking to Keenan and Danny's house to visit a family that had visited the church. Bishop, you're this little girl. John and Beth, uh, many times I spent in your home. Known Kyle since he was a baby. I'm getting old. You know, as I was sitting there preparing for this week, I I thought through the years of all the kids I've seen grow up through the church. My oldest was next door working at Children's Church right now, and seeing Margo and Jason and the Lyles, and a couple of years I'd be us standing up here with kids ready to walk across the stage. And I know some of you guys have already had kids walk across the stage and the change of life, and but the exciting times knowing that they're in God's hand. And I want to tell you that um, I'm very proud of the three that have graduated from our church. God has great things in store for your life. For mom and dads, I pray for you guys that I, I know this is a transition time for you all. And I pray for you this morning as much as I pray for your children. And I thank God for them. But the most important thing is that I thank God that he never leaves our kids just the way he never leaves us. And this morning, our scripture, um, this is a message for our graduates, but not just for our graduates, but for everyone that's in here today. And the title of this message says, Your Time Is Now. And I started thinking about this message, I actually been preparing for it for several weeks, and as I've been praying and saying, God, what is it that you would have for us to say to our graduates, and what passage of scripture would we look at, and my mind kept going back to Joshua. In the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, we're told that God called and commissioned Joshua to be the successor of Moses. God gave Joshua good news concerning his future. And for the graduates today, I want to tell you that God has good news for you and all the challenges that you're going to face in life. I want to begin to read to you out of Joshua chapter 1 today. So if you have your scriptures, open to Joshua chapter 1 today. And I'm going to begin in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, My servant is dead. That's putting it kind of blunt. Joshua, if you hadn't noticed, Moses is dead. Now then you and all these people... Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give you to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And I love this part right here. I challenge you, underline your scripture, start, keep it, write it on your mirror. Remember this passage of scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, I don't know about you parents, but that gets me excited because I see how God has been with me in my life. I see how God has walked beside me and through the trying times, through the good times, that God has never left me, nor will he never forsake me. I know this promise of Scripture is true. So what gets me excited about this passage of Scripture, here's Moses who's been this great leader, one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world. Now here's Joshua, this young man who had followed under Moses' leadership, and he's seen the great things that God has done through Moses. Now check this out. He goes, Joshua, Moses is dead. Now it's your time, Joshua. Joshua, I've been preparing you. And Joshua, you've been getting ready for this your entire life, Joshua. You are the man that I've called. And Joshua, I want you to listen to me. He goes, Joshua, I have this promise that I'm going to give you every place that you touch your foot. The same promise that I gave to Moses, Joshua, I'm giving to you. And I will never leave you. 
and I will never forsake you. So parents, just as you've seen God work in your life, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? I I don't know about you, but that excites me this morning, that the same God who was with you is the same God with your children, with your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, and their children to come. That's the God that we serve this morning. And the scripture goes on to tell us that he says, Joshua, nobody will be able to stand against you. You know why? Because the Lord is with you. You see, God has called you. Every one of us in this room right now, God has called you and he's given you a purpose. And I want to tell you something. Your purpose in life is much bigger than you. I want you to understand that God has given you a purpose in life and your purpose is much bigger and much greater than you are. And it's not just for you, it's for others. God has a plan for your life. And he promised you that he would be with you the whole time. That's a promise that you need to remember. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, God's going to be with you. All the way in Oklahoma, Bishop, God's going to be with you. More importantly, Mom and Dad, God's going to be with you. In Joshua 1, 6-9, it says this, Be strong and courageous, for you will lead my people to possess all the land I swore to give their ancestors. Be strong and very courageous. Obey all the laws Moses gave you. Do not turn away from them, and you will be successful in everything you do. Study the book of the law continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be sure to obey all that is written in it. Only then will you succeed. I command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So today I want to tell you something. There's good news for the graduates, and it includes four promises this morning that I want to give you. If you have your bulletins this morning, if you want to flip over to the back of your bulletins, there's a sermon outline and some notes in there today if you want to follow along. If you need a bulletin, just raise your hand, and one of the guys in the back will be glad to get you a bulletin. But there are four promises that I want to go over today. The very first promise is this, God's promise of success. As we read in Joshua 7 through 8 earlier, it says, Be strong and very courageous. Obey all the laws Moses gave you. Do not turn from them and you will be successful in everything that you do. Study the book of the law continually, meditate on it day and night, and make sure that you obey all that is written in it. And listen to this, only then will you succeed. You see, success comes through obedience. I'm going to tell you something, church. You can know all you want to about the Word of God, but until you become obedient to you, it's useless knowledge. You can know all the facts about Scripture, You can know all the things you want to about God, but until you apply it to your life, it really doesn't do you any good. But when you begin to obey the promises that God has for you, he goes, you will succeed. It says, obey the things that you've been taught in Scripture. Do not turn from them. And God promises that you will be successful, not in some things, listen to this, but in everything that you do. When you're obedient to the Word of God, you will be successful in everything you do. And some of you go, well, Pastor Shannon, how, how is that possible that I'm going to be successful in everything? You want to know why? Because when you're obedient to the Word of God, your will aligns with His will. It's no longer I'm trying to do what I want to do, but God, I'm being obedient to what you've called me to do. You'll find out in life that people are going to tell you to do all that you can do, be all that you can be. I'm going to tell you right now, don't be all you can be. There's not enough time in a day. When I was younger, I used to think about all the things that I would love to do. I would like to learn this and be able to do this, and I would love to learn this and do all that. But one thing I learned out, you know what? There's not enough time in the day. I have just enough time in the day to do what God has called me to do. You see, I can't be all things for all people. I have to be everything that God's called me to be personally. And you in your life right now, I don't care if you're 18 or you're 88, God has given you 24 hours in a day. God has given you a specific plan and a specific purpose for your life. You can't do all things for all people, but you can do all that God has called you to do. Remember that in your life and you'll be successful. Study this book. 
If you study the word of God, God promises that you will succeed in life. I challenge you to get into the word of God. Know God's promises. Know the scripture and how to live a holy life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, and I quoted it earlier. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. That's God's promise to you right now, to give you a hope and a future. No matter where you're at in your life right now, you may be in a place in your life, say, Pastor, you know, I, I graduated quite a few years ago. And I don't seem like I have much of a hope or a future right now. Can I tell you that when we're obedient to the word of God, God promises us that he will give us a hope and a future. Our job is simply to be obedient. God promises us that he will give us success. God has a plan for your life. Now, in understanding God's plan for our life, I want you to understand something. God's plans for our life are not necessarily our plans for our life. They're not necessarily your parents' plans for your life or your friends or your coaches or anyone else. But God created you with a very specific purpose, with a very specific calling. When in high school, I played baseball with a young man by the name of Jason Suit. Jason was probably one of the greatest baseball players that I'd ever seen play and play with it personally. Jason Suit was about 5'11", weighed about 195 pounds. He was left-handed. He threw the ball 93 miles an hour in high school. He bet over 600. He was an MVP from a ninth grade to a 12th grade. He was probably the most dedicated, hard-working baseball player I'd ever met. Jason would work out all the time, and I used to laugh, and I would go to the games, and his dad pastored a church in Lynchburg. And at every game, his dad would sit there with a radar gun, and he would record how fast every pitch he threw, what pitch he threw, and the location of every pitch. And he would sit there constantly and watch Jason. Jason went to Liberty University on a full ride baseball scholarship. At Liberty University, after his freshman year, I remember Jason Suit got kicked out of school for shoplifting. He decided he was going to go to the mall at Christmas time and get something for his sister, but he didn't want to pay for it. It totally changed his life. You see, through that, in Jason Suit's life, what Jason did is he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. And God totally changed Jason's plan. Jason was one of those kids who could have got drafted out of high school, could have got drafted after graduating from Liberty University. But I remember his sophomore year when he came back to school. I was sitting there talking with Jason. He said, you know, he said, Shannon, he goes, God has totally changed my life. He said, I owe everything I got to God. He said, he placed a calling in my life I've been running for for years. He said, God's called me to preach. Jason went on the seminary. He's got his doctorate degree. He's pastoring a church in Lynchburg now that's growing like crazy. And I remember a few years ago, I was talking with Jason, and uh, one of his friends he played with has been playing Major League Baseball for quite a, quite a while, and he was in town, and one of the... Uh, one of the scouts was there with him. They're all sitting there talking. He looked at my friend Jason. He goes, I heard you used to be a pretty good baseball player. Jason said, I enjoyed playing while I, while I had the opportunity. He said, well, son, he goes, it's a shame that you gave your life away. He said, you didn't do anything with your career. And Jason started laughing. He said, sir, he said, I found my life. He said, I didn't give it away. He said, as a matter of fact, he goes, I have peace. I have joy. I have hope. And I know exactly where my future is. He said, but if you don't change your life, he said, you're the one who's going to lose everything. You see, he realized something, that God had placed a calling upon his life. All the coaches had already planned out Jason's life. His dad, who was a pastor, thought Jason's calling was to play baseball. He's his greatest supporter that his son has. But God had specifically called him into the ministry. You see, church, until we become obedient to the word of God, we're missing the future that God has for us. You see, I, for your graduates that are here today, and maybe you're in a place in between jobs or whatever, it's not what somebody else has for you in life, but it's what God has for you in life. 
Jason uh, is one of my I said one of my really good friends, and um, right now he's on the pastoral team with uh, Jerry Jr. down at Liberty University. He's actually his, his one of his mentors. He mentors Jerry Jr. and he meets with Jonathan Falwell a lot, and he's part of that team there. But God chose to use this young man in a mighty way. How does God want to use you? You see, godly success is much, much different than worldly success. You see, the world would say that if you have this great job and you make all this money or whatever it may be, that you're going to be successful, that, that you have the career that you want it to have. But I'm going to tell you what, there's millions of people that have lived on this earth that have had everything that money could buy, and they're miserable. There are people who die every day that could have anything that they wanted yet they have no fulfillment in life. They have no joy in life. They have no peace in life. Can I tell you something, church? When you give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and you can find fulfillment, you can find peace, you can find joy, you can find love in life, guess what? You've succeeded in life. When you're able to do what God has called you to do to help other people, you've succeeded in life. Can I get an amen this morning? I, I don't know about you. I was talking with Lisa this morning, and Lisa's been teaching in children's church over here in Sunday school she assisted with her mom for a while, and she said, I don't remember exactly when I started. She goes, I work with mom forever, and she said, for over 30 years, I've been working in the Sunday school department teaching children. Amen. That deserves a hand clap. Anybody who can work with kids for 30 years is an angel in my book. Fulfillment. Are you helping change somebody else's life? The second thing is God's promise of security. Listen to verses 6, 7, and 9. Be strong and courageous. Just in case you didn't get it in verse 6, in verse 7 it goes, Be strong and very courageous. And Joshua, if you don't get it then, he goes, I command you, be strong and courageous. If you listen to the whole verse of, of verse 9, it says this, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified or do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord will be with you wherever you go. What an awesome promise from God that God says, hey, wherever you go that I'm going to be with you, don't be afraid, don't be terrified. Do not have any fear. Fear not, he said. Take courage. I am with you. Right now, I am with you. You will never, ever, ever be alone. When you're sitting in that dorm room and everybody else is gone and mom and dad's not there, guess what? You're not alone. God's right there with you. I remember the very first, uh, very first week that I moved here from Lynchburg. I remember I was in the parsonage next door is where I lived at, and I was, I was unmarried. I was single. I had no friends here at the church. I didn't know anybody. The only person I really knew was Pastor George, and he scared me to death. And I remember it was a Friday night. I was about 22 years old. And I remember sitting in the parsons across the street, and I was all by myself. I didn't know anybody. And I remember for the first time in my life, I probably cried. I cried out of fear. Saying, God, where in the world have you put me? God, what are you doing? God, I don't want to be here. But God, I know that you called me. And looking back now, 20 years later, it's the greatest blessing of my life. I remember as I sat there that night, I remember God, this, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was way louder. God reminded me, I'm right here with you. You're not alone. Graduates, if you'll be obedient to God and his word, you'll never, ever be alone. He'll be right there with you. You'll find your security, your image, your being, everything about you in him. Imagine how Joshua felt. His mentor, his friend, one of the greatest leaders of all time is gone. And God says, 
Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them. He said, Joshua, you're my man. Joshua, you've been preparing. And I want to tell you, graduates, you've been preparing all of your life for this point right now. To leave home. To leave mom and dad. To go off to school, to go off to a trade or whatever it may be. God's been preparing you for this moment. Mom and daddy's been preparing you all for this moment. and I know it comes way too quick. But God's been preparing you. God prepares all of us in different ways. Some of you right now, you're saying, well, Pastor, you know, uh, I was 18, but it was a few years ago. Well, I've got good news for you. At 40 years old, Moses left Egypt. 40 years of education in Egypt, the greatest education in the world at the time. Then for 40 years, God placed him in a desert to speak to him, to teach him more. And guess what? At the age of 80, God called Moses to leave. So for some of you guys in the church, I'm a pastor, I'm getting a little bit older now. Pastor, I'm not as young as I used to be. Guess what? It's time for you to step up as well. For some of you, God said, hey, step up and step out. I'm not done with you yet. As long as you have breath in your life, I want you to listen to this. As long as you have breath in your life, God has a purpose for you. God specifically wants to use you. It may be to teach. It may be to do nothing but to simply stay on your knees and pray. But God is not finished with you yet. God still wants to use you. Your time, no matter who you are in this sanctuary right now, your time is now. You will have certain preparation for certain things in your life, but God is preparing you for what he's called you for. Number three is God's provisions of his precepts. Listen to God's principles. In Joshua 1, 7, it says, Obey all the laws Moses gave you. Do not turn away from them. In Joshua 1, 8, it says, Obey all that is written in it. Study the book of law continually. Meditate on it day and night. Now think about this for just a moment. Joshua, the only thing he had at the time were the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were the only books that he had to go by. And God said, I want you to meditate on my word. And God said, well, just with these five books right here, I'm going to give you the promised land. Could you imagine if we really dive into God's word, what God wants to do in our lives? We have the entire scriptures at our fingertips. I don't know about you, but I said, I want us to be an Acts chapter 2 church. I've been reading and studying the book of Acts right now, and that's where I'm at in my devotional life. And the more that I read in the book of Acts, and I see God's plan throughout history, the more excited I get. As a matter of fact, from the beginning in Genesis, and I'm not going to preach the whole Bible to you guys this morning, but in the beginning of Genesis this morning, when sin came into the world, God said, it's okay, I already have a plan. Then he sent his son Jesus, and, and Jesus went and he died on the cross, and he was raised from the dead, and then all of a sudden, they still didn't quite understand what was going on, but at the resurrection, the disciples said, hey, we begin to understand now what's going on. It was the purpose of Jesus the whole time to die for the sins of the world. And he goes, you know what, by his blood, by his blood we're saved that sin is forgiven if we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us. Now here's the good part. He said, not only am I going to ascend into heaven, he said, this is the promise in Acts, it came in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to send you another helper and the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, we see right here, all of a sudden, Peter stands up in the midst of the people. He begins to preach, and check us out, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and thousands of people got saved. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. All of a sudden, I begin to realize that God wants to do something in our midst. And right here, we have the Word of God, the living Word of God. In the Scripture, if you read on the book of Acts, it says that Paul was so close to God, and God called him out to go to the Gentiles that people would come, and they would even touch his handkerchief and be healed. Guys, this is New Testament stuff right here. The power of God was changing lives. You sit here and you read the miracles of what happened in the book of Acts. I want to tell you what, God still wants to do miracles today. God's not done. The question is, are we willing to get out of our comfort zones? Are we willing to 
willing to be what God's called us to be this morning. I don't know about you, but I want to do exactly what God's called me to do. I want to be obedient to his scripture. Amen? I, I believe there's teenagers in this church that God's called to be pastors and missionaries and teachers and preachers. The question is, will we be obedient? There are four things under here, five things under here, excuse me, that if you'll do in your life, if you use these principles in your life, it would change your life. A, it says make a commitment to reading your Bible daily. I'm going to tell you what, if you'll read your Bible daily, it will totally change your life. If you don't read your Bible, Bible, you're going to become spiritually anemic and you will die. If you don't eat food, you will die. If you don't digest the word of God, I'm going to tell you this right now, church, you can't live from Sunday to Sunday alone. It's so important that you read the Bible. B says, read the Bible in a systematic way. Have a plan. I, I'm going to tell you, in, in your life and anything that you do, if you want to be successful, first of all, you better have a plan. Set a time that you're going to do it. It's not going to just happen. Be disciplined. Be disciplined, be disciplined, be disciplined. And I, I'm going to tell you as Americans, this is one of the hardest things we do. Just look around. We live in a fast food generation. We're not very disciplined at all. I've added some weight on. I haven't been disciplined. I'm going to tell you. Be disciplined. The other thing I tell you this is to journal. You say, well, Pastor, why journaling? I'm going to tell you why journaling is so important. First of all, you can look back and you can see what God's done. But also when you journal, it's also another discipline. Every day when I get my journal, I write down the first thing in the morning, I write down what the date is. I write down what scripture that I'm reading. And then anything that I glean out of God's word that he teaches me that day. Then after I do that, I begin to pray. And I write down all the specific prayer requests and specific things that are going on in my life and there's ongoing prayer. If you were to get a hold of my prayer journal, which I, I, I covet my prayer journal more than anything I have, you'll see your individual names in there, especially when different things are going on in your life. And the very first thing I do every day is I read God's word, I journal, and I pray. And I want you to know one of the first things I do every day, I believe, first of all, it starts at home. Prayer in schools is never going to change. Prayer at home is going to change people's lives. The very first thing I do is I pray for my family, pray for them specifically. The second thing I do every day is I pray for the church. That means I pray for each and every one of you every day. And you see, it's so important that we have these disciplines in our life and that you have a systematic way of reading the Bible. Don't just open the Bible up, but study a chapter at a time, study a book at a time, whatever it may be. Take time to really understand God's Word and digest it. See, pray each time you read your Bible, asking God to speak to you from his word and to continually reveal his plan for your life. Seek God's face and say, God, would you open up your word to me? I'm going to tell you, every time I read the Bible, God speaks to me in different ways. It, isn't it amazing that you can sit there and you can read the same passage of scripture that I'm reading and God will speak to you exactly where you're at? That's how we know God's word is alive and it's well when it's living, that, that the God himself, through the power of the Holy Spirit, speaks to us each and every day as we open up his word. D, do those things that God reveals to you from his word. You see, as God reveals things to you in his word, you have to be obedient. The church, can I be real honest with you? That's not always easy. There's sometimes God calls us to do things and asks us to do things that's way out of our comfort zone. It doesn't always make sense to us. But as from God, we always know it's right. God's going to stretch you. He's going to challenge you. But it comes back to one question, will I be obedient? And if I'm obedient, listen to this. This is the promise of God's word. This isn't my words. You will be successful, God said. That's his promise to us. E says, hide God's word in your heart.
it's so important that we memorize Scripture. Knowing Scripture is how we attack the enemy when he's attacking us. When we're down and we're discouraged, we can remember the Scripture. God says, don't be discouraged. Don't be terrified, but be strong and courageous. When we don't know where to turn and we're, we're struggling, and we don't know which path we should go on, God's Word always gives us encouragement. I remember when I was in college, and uh, I worked at Lynchburg First Church of the Nazarene while I was in college for about three years. I worked in children's ministry there. I got my first license to preach when I was 19 years old. And I knew that was the calling God had placed upon my life. I didn't understand what all that meant at the time, but I was trying to be obedient and go through the steps where God was calling me. And it was about the end of those three years when I knew God had released me from the church that I was at and God was calling me here. And, and as I told you before, I, I struggled with that. I didn't quite understand it because all my friends and my family and everybody I knew and everything I knew was there at the church I was at. And I just didn't understand why God was calling me away from there at the time. One of the things I do remember uh, is a letter that actually my mom wrote to me that I've always cherished. But I remember specifically the scripture verse she wrote. It was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I remember she hand wrote it. She wrote it out in the letter she wrote to me. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. I learned a lot from that scripture over the years, and it's meant so much more to me over the years. And the more I read it, the more I understand it, the more it means. You see, I have one simple job, and that's to trust the Lord. He's got the big job to make my path straight. You see, I don't have to wonder in life what I'm doing or where I'm going. I have one simple job, and that job is to trust the Lord. And when I hide God's word into my heart, when the enemy comes to attack me and says, hey, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, I remind him that he's a liar straight from the pits of hell. You see, John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may not just have life, but have life more abundantly. And the more that I begin to understand God's word, guess what? I'm not a slave to people. I'm not a slave to people's thoughts or what other people may think of me or this or that or the other. You know what I realized? That I'm a slave to one person that I choose to be a slave to, and that's Jesus Christ. God, I choose to give my entire life to you. Can I tell you what? When we get to that place in our life, you will find fulfillment and joy like you've never, ever found or thought was possible. Listen to Psalms 19, 9, 11. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I will seek you with all my heart. Do not, do not let me stray from your command. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Grandma and grandpa, moms, dads, Get on your knees and pray for your families. Get on your knees and pray for your children. Life is very short. We're not promised tomorrow. The greatest gift you can ever give to your kids is Jesus Christ. It's not the things of this world that you can give them but it's the things from heaven. Be a godly example for your children. It's never too late. And so, Pastor, my kids are getting older now. My kids are already out of the house. I'm going to tell you what, your kids are always watching you. I don't care what age you are. I still look up to my father just as I did when I was a kid in different ways now. We have a different relationship than we did when I was a kid. But I still look up to him. I still watch him. I still watch my mom. I recognize I'm in a place right now that my kids watch everything that I do. 
You see, church, uh, people always laugh. They always say, well, you know, you're a pastor. You live in a glass house. The truth of the matter is we all live in glass houses because somebody's always watching you. And that's why we got to be very careful, too, to never pick up a stone and throw it because we all live in glass houses. The fourth thing, and I'll leave you with this this morning, to me is probably one of the most important of all God's promises. This is the promise of God's presence. Joshua 1 9 says this The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Being in the presence of God is the greatest blessing you will ever have. As I was writing this message, you know, I started thinking about Mary, Jesus' earthly mother. As I thought about how the angel of the Lord came to Mary, listen to what he said. He says, Mary, God has found favor with you. A little bit later in that passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 2, he said, you are highly favored. Now, I want you to understand something, church. I don't know about you, but I would much rather have the favor and blessing of God upon my life than anything this world could ever offer me. Now, here's Mary, this young teenage girl, and the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, Mary, you are going to have God's son. Now, I'm going to tell you what, that sounds kind of messed up. And I'm sitting there thinking, if I'm a young teenage girl, which thank God I'm not, uh, or if I'm Joseph, (laughs) this doesn't sound quite right. But Mary recognized her relationship with God Mary recognized what God was saying to her. And listen to what Mary said. She goes, may it be as you have said. Basically what she's saying is, God, whatever you want from me, God, I will do it. Now, I'm going to tell you what. If you would have went to Mary's mom and dad and said, uh, Mary is going to be chosen to be God's daughter. We know she's not married right now to excuse me, God's mother. Um, we, 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 we recognize right now she's not married, but this is the plan that I have. Every parent would have said, God, can't you choose somebody else? She's just a young teenage girl. She's not even married yet. Now think about it. Mary knew, think about this for a moment. Mary knew that every day when she woke up for the next nine months that she was going to be the talk of the town. That she recognized that if she came to Joseph, who she was engaged to be married to, and goes, Joseph, I want you to understand something. I'm pregnant, but this is God's son. How well would that went over? She recognized that every time that she went to, to the market, that people were going to say, hey, there's that, there's that Mary. She's pregnant, but we knew she wasn't married. She wasn't married to Joseph at the time. You do the math. Did you hear that some of them said that she's going to have God's son? You see, I'm going to tell you something. Life's not always going to be easy. Do you think it was easy for Mary during that time, for all those months, then trying to raise a perfect child, seriously, literally, a perfect child? Mom, you're not doing that right. Dad, should you say that? Think about that for a moment. It wasn't easy. But you know what? God says, Mary, my favor and my blessing has been placed upon you. And I want you to think about this for just a moment. God chose Mary, this young teenage girl, to usher in the Savior of the world. I want to tell you something. God's plans are much bigger than your plans. When you sell out to God and say, God, I will be obedient to you, God will take you places and do things with your life that you never, ever thought was even possible. God wants to bless you in ways that you don't even begin to understand. Mary knew it wasn't going to be easy, but she knew that she was under the covering and the favor and the blessing of God. God's purpose for you in life is to be in a relationship with him that he may use you to literally change the world. He took 12 disciples and turned the world upside down but i want you to remember something it was never about them and it's not about you it's literally all about him it's the church right now i want you to understand something the church is not about us it's about lost people the church is a hospital for hurting people it's not a museum for the saints god wants to use the church his people to reach a lost and dying world 
God wants to use you. God chooses to use you. That's why you've heard me for the last several months, and you're going to continue to hear it, that, that as I've been praying, as I've been reading, and as I've been searching God's word uh, about the future of the church, and one of the things I pray for every single day is for vision, wisdom, and direction. That's why I believe there's no doubt in my mind why God's called us to start this Compassion Center. Starting in September, every Wednesday, we're going to be feeding hungry people. There are going to be people walking through our doors that, you know what, they don't even know they need Jesus. They just know they're hungry. They need something. We're going to meet their physical needs. We're going to meet their spiritual needs. Not only in September, we start in their, our food pantry, but we've already started Celebrate Recovery in our church. And, and, and for, for quite a while now, we've been in trainings and, and going through different things and preparation. And for, for months and months that have been going on, people have been getting ready for Celebrate Recovery. And, and every week on Friday nights, we're going to be having a Celebrate Recovery meeting where people can come in with their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups. If you guys remember the beginning of the year, we went through this whole series on recovery and how God wants to help you in your life. There's, everybody in this church has a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up. Everybody in the world has hurts and habits and hang-ups. You know what? They need Jesus. And it's their responsibility to the church. Jesus said, if you'll do the, le to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so we recognize and we realize that God's called us to start this compassion center to reach people. And I'm going to tell you what, as I said before, sometimes we're praying and we're reading God's word and God says, hey, I chose you to do it. It's not always easy, church. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I won't for, I'll never forget. I was sitting there and I, I kept reading through the Gospels. And as I was reading through the Gospels and I was studying the Bible and I was looking at Jesus feeding the 5,000 and and, and I kept coming back to where he looked at the disciples, and the disciples said, hey, Lord, send them away. We don't have any food for them. And Jesus looked at the disciples, and he told them this, you feed them. And I never will forget the words were jumping off the page. And so what I do is in the morning, I, I read. In the morning, I, I do my devotions in the morning, and I usually go through a chapter at a time. And I journal and stuff. But in the evenings, I always go through where I can read through the Bible in a year. So I'll read about three chapters. And it just happened that in my devotional time at that point, I was in... And, and at that point, I was in the book of John, but I was also going through the Gospels in the evening as well. And, and, and for weeks straight, I kept reading through this part about the disciples. And Jesus looked at the disciples and says, you feed them. I don't know about you, but I grew up getting spankings. We had a woodshed literally at my house, and we had a switch tree. And the thing you didn't want to hear is your mom said, go pick your switch. Because she knew how to use it. And if you didn't get the right one, and she had to go pick it, you're really in trouble. And, and then you had those words that, uh, that came after that you always hated, and you wait until your daddy gets home. Amen. So some of you understand what it means to be taken out behind the woodshed, if you understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about a spiritual spanking. I'm talking about conviction. So I was reading through that scripture. God asked me a question. What are you doing for the least of these? You feed my people. Well, God, I don't know if we have the people. I don't know if we have the resources. God said, I didn't ask you what you have. I told you what to do. God said, will you be obedient? And I'll be honest, I prayed for this for quite a while. God, this is much bigger than I am. God reminded me how much bigger than you are. The more I prayed, the more I knew what God was calling us to do. At the same time, God had laid this preschool upon our hearts, and we've been talking about it for a while, but we knew it was time. God also said, bring the little children unto me. So we recognize right now what God's called us to do as a church. To reach hurting people, to love children and families. That's why we're doing this recovery ministry, to celebrate recovery, the food pantry. We're doing the preschool. and I talk to a lot of people. They say, oh, preschool is a great business to be in. I said, well, you don't get it if you think it's a business. It's about lost people. You see, my prayer is to see hundreds of kids coming across this parking lot, literally hundreds of kids six, seven days a week. 
but they're coming through our hallways and they're hearing about Jesus. You see, church, if it's just about us who are sitting here right now, we've missed the boat. Graduates, if you think graduating and getting the degree and starting the career that you want to be in is just about you, you've missed the boat. It's about the calling that God has placed upon your life. And I challenge you to ask yourself this question today. God, am I fulfilling the mission that you've called me to, called me to fulfill? God, am I fulfilling the purpose that you have for my life? God, is my education, is it about me or is it about you? I'm going to tell you what. This is not what I prayed for in my life. As a matter of fact, when I graduated from high school, I knew I was called into the ministry. Before that, I always thought I'd be a CPA. Thank God I'm not. Never in a million years would I thought I'd be a pastor. I've told some of you guys this story before, and I never will forget it. We were coming back from, a, from one of our first youth trips when I was a youth pastor. I've been here for a while, and our youth group had grown. As a matter of fact, we were running about 120 kids on roll. We see 60, 80 kids. And I remember we were coming back from camp one year from a spring retreat we did. We had done a big mud run, and we lost about 60 pairs of shoes that weekend. And I had to come back and explain to the parents what happened to all the kids' shoes. And we dug these mud pits with back hose, and we built retaining walls and climbing walls. And we, we, had, we had a lot of fun. A lot of kids got saved. And, and I remember coming back to this, this the spiritual high that you have coming back from a weekend like that. And I remember as we was coming back, we stopped at the little Wendy's right there in Appomattox off 460. Of course, when I was a kid, we didn't have anything but a stoplight and a pizza hut. And it's grown a little bit since I was a kid. And I walked into that Wendy's restaurant. We've got this big school bus, and we've got bands with us. We've got kids piled in everywhere. And all of a sudden, I'm walking out. I hold the door, and there's this guy that walks in. He sees me. He goes, hey, Shannon, what are you doing? I was like, hey, I'm doing good. I hadn't seen this guy in years. We went to high school together when I was at Appomattox before I transferred to LCA. And he goes, man, you better hurry up getting here. He goes, there's a whole school bus full of kids out there. He goes, you better hurry up getting here. He goes, he goes it's going to be wild in this place. I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm with them. He goes, what are you doing with all those kids with a church group? I said, well, I said, I'm the youth pastor. He started laughing, said a few choice words. He goes, quit lying to me. I said, no, really. I said, I'm the youth pastor of the church. He goes, Blankety blank, I never thought you'd be a pastor. He goes, he goes, I, I knew I know you. I said, Well, you knew the old me. He said, But God's changed my life. The greatest decision I ever made in my life was to follow Jesus Christ. Second greatest decision I made in my life was to be all in. It wasn't God, I just want all of you, but God, I want you to have all of me. I look back at my life, and I thank God for every one of you, because each and every one of you have impacted my life. Bishop from January, a little kid, to Diane Holden Hunter when he was little, now I look up to him, to seeing Kyle grow up, become a man, and John and Beth, and I had hair when I first came here. It wasn't very much for a little bit. It was darker when I had it, too. But knowing that, God, I'm all in. The question for you today is, are you all in? If you haven't sold out, my challenge to you is that you would be all in. Don't be a spectator on the sidelines. There's no fun sitting on the sidelines when God's called you to be a part of the game. Remember in high school, I was in a car accident. There was a time when I couldn't play sports. That was probably one of the worst parts of high school that I can remember. There's no fun sitting on the sidelines when you know you should be in the game. There's no fun just sitting in a chair when God's called you to do much more. Bishop, Hunter, I know Kyle's not here. When you go off to college, find a church. 
stay in a church. Be the church. Don't sit on the sidelines. If you're in the church today and you've been sitting on the sidelines, it's time to get off. It's time to get in the game. We're going to have vacation Bible school in two weeks, and uh, Pastor Kathleen, all the kids call her Pastor Keck. She could use your help for the next next week in vacation Bible school, excuse me, two weeks from now. Go over there and see her. Maybe you can't physically work with the kids, but you can help fix snacks. Maybe if nothing else, you can encourage her. So you know what, Kathleen? I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for vacation Bible school. I'm going to set time aside. But you know what? All of us can help in some kind of way. You know, this is something for our whole church. We had, we had a group that went out um, yesterday. I think about 70 bags with invitations. They went and they knocked on doors and they gave to kids and families. That's what church is all about. So I challenge you, get off the sidelines, get in the game. As I said at the very beginning, your time is now.